praise the Lord. It's good to be with you this morning. And, you know, having a message to share, sometimes you appreciate how the, the different messages of the convention dovetail and support each other. But then also as, as a, someone who has a message at convention, when someone announces the same topic, you're kind of like, uh-oh, what's going to happen? Uh, so when Pastor Wallace said he was speaking on Elijah, kind of had that moment. But then, you know, he spoke on something totally different about his life, and so I thought, oh, praise the Lord. All right, it's preparation, work done. And uh, so I wanted to look with you this morning at some of the experience, experiences from the life of Elijah. Um, of course, Elijah is one of the two olive trees, as Zechariah says. Along with Moses, they are the anointed ones that stand before the Lord of the whole earth. And they're remarkable men who have a deep connection with our Heavenly Father and with Christ. Um, you know, a relationship with the living God. And, but what's interesting about these two men in particular is that God allowed us not just to see them in their power and in the Lord flowing through them and using them in mighty things, but I think it's, it's amazing that God let us see us in their highest state of power and ministry, but also at their lowest when they were, at least they felt defeated, discouraged. Was God going to use them anymore? And they were at that state, and God revealed, not only that, I'm sure many of the saints in Scripture felt that, but God revealed it, and He showed it to us. And so we saw, we see them in some very dry times of inactivity, where they're not flowing in power, but then also times where they are both recommissioned, at God's holy mountain. And they're used by God to do wonderful things. And, you know, it says, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10, 11, all these things happened for our example. They're written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. And I was just thinking of that phrase, upon whom the ends of the world are come, holds more and more truth for us as time progresses, doesn't it? As we look at that generation that we are a part of, that we're in, and, and the season that we feel that is coming upon the earth, well, those examples are for us now that we need. And so um, I've been meditating on the lives of these two great men, um, how God designed their lives to bring his people encouragement and strength, even to Christ. They were, they were the ones who appeared on what we have termed the Mount of Transfiguration, and they strengthened him for the trials that, that lay ahead. And as we consider their lives, we can receive strength and encouragement. You know, the church in the last days, when we're facing pressure and persecution, the Lord is going to send these two men again. And, that, and what's so wonderful is that the Antichrist is not going to be able to do anything to stop them. They're going to have free reign to preach the, the name of Christ, to preach truth in the midst of a very wicked and perverse, the most wicked and perverse generation on earth. They won't be able to stop it. You know, today there is so much false narrative, so, much, so many things false that are being said. Um, I don't even like to watch the news really anymore because you kind of have to sift through so much. And, and there's so many trying to share a false narrative to get people to believe what is their agenda or so forth. Well, that's nothing compared to what's coming with the Antichrist. He's going to magnify and amplify what is false, and it will dominate everything we hear and see. But in the midst of that, these two prophets are going to come, and they're gonna, there will be absolutely nothing that can be done to stop them from ministering for three and a half years. And, you know, and if they, if they are tried to stop, we know fire comes from and consumes their enemies and other miracles and so forth. And I just think we as a church, where are we going to be? Well, we're going to be uh, hiding here and there and in our, in our little sheltered places. And we're going to be seeing what's going on. And it's just going to be so encouraging to our heart as we see these, the lives of these two men battling and preaching righteousness and so forth, especially in the the days to come. And so I wanted to look with you just for a moment at some experiences from the life of Elijah 
And specifically, I wanted to look at the three different levels of provision that Elijah experienced in his ministry. And let's turn, if we would, to 1 Kings 17, and we're going to pick up the story that after Elijah has prayed earnestly that it would not rain. We know Elijah prayed twice. The first time he prayed that it would not rain, and then he prayed three and a half years later that it would rain. But we're looking at the first time. After he had prayed that it would rain, or that it would, sorry, that it would not rain, then God spoke to him. Uh, well, he proclaimed to Ahab that it wouldn't rain, and then, then the Lord spoke to Elijah in 1 Kings 17 and verse 2. It says, The word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Get thee hence, turn east, hide yourself by the brook Cherith that is before Jordan, and it shall be that you shall drink of the brook that I've commanded, the, and then I've commanded the ravens to feed thee there. And so he went and he did according to the word of the Lord. And he went and dwelt by the brook Cherith that's before Jordan. And the ravens brought him bread and flesh in the morning and bread and flesh in the evening, and he drank of the brook. And so the first directive God gives to Elijah is go to a place and wait. And in so doing, God would provide for him. So he went to a lonely place. When you think about it, I mean, I don't think there was anyone else there except that he got visited twice a day by the birds, by the ravens. And he had to wait beside that little brook, Cherith. And so it was probably a, that was probably a little seasonal stream that received water from the mountains and it flowed down as a tributary into the Jordan. And the word Cherith means to cut, to cut, to divide. And sometimes God can meet us in mighty ways. He can use us in, in ways that we so appreciate how he moves through us and in our lives and we, we love the moving of the water, the moving of his spirit as he flows. But then sometimes we're brought into another season where we're just planted by a little brook without much activity, without much going on. And it's like God begins to cut. He begins to remove extraneous things, even activities, even ministry, sometimes provisions relationships, friendships, and so forth. But sometimes it's all those things we had come to rely upon in the past. And now we only have one thing to rely upon, the Lord's provision, the Lord sustaining us and meeting us in the wilderness. But it's that God desires to meet with us in a new way to experience new level, uh, a new level of trust, a new level of provision in his presence. And, but in that time, God did bring a little provision. He had that continual provision of the, the ravens. Elijah got two square meals a day. Now, I don't know how much a raven can carry in its mouth or how many ravens came, but they brought little drops of bread. I, I don't know if they can carry a whole loaf, but they can carry some crumbs from the loaf. And so maybe they, they kept dro- dropping an accumulation of crumbs and still he had enough to eat for a meal and some, some flesh you know, brought by the ravens. It was limited, but it was enough. And he was sustained in that. We don't know how long. Pastor Bailey thinks it could have been over a year or perhaps even two years continuing in that. And so God can bring us down to that little bit where he wants us to focus on that and to be faithful with that. I'm reminded of the parable in Luke chapter 19, where the master gave a certain amount of money to each of his servants, and he said to them, occupy till I return. And after a season, the master returned, and he looks to his servants to see how much they had increased with what they had been given. And he said this in Luke 19, verse 16, then he came to the first, or then came the first unto his master, and he saying, Lord, Your pound is gained, 10 pounds. And he said unto him, well done, well done, you good servant, because you have been faithful with a very little, you'll have authority over 10 cities. And so here's a servant that had been given a little amount. He was faithful with it. He developed it. He cultivated it. He increased it. And when the master saw that, the reward was authority over cities. 
And in one sense, we all have been given our little portion, our little portion of the kingdom of God. And he's given us that opportunity to work it, to cultivate it, to increase it, to gain fruit for him. And the admonition for us is to be faithful in it, even if it seems very little. You know, we want to be people of faith. We want to have a vision for great things, for increase, for blessing and anointing. That is what God wants our future to be. But it can't be at the expense of what God has given us today. The increase comes The blessing comes when we're faithful with what we have been given today. The Lord said to Israel, today, if you'll hear my voice. Also in Zechariah 4, in verse 10, where he asks the question, who has despised the day of small things? For they shall rejoice. They shall rejoice. Who are they? The ones who have been faithful in those small things when they see the measure of what God has produced in them through that faithfulness by His Spirit, they will rejoice. And it's interesting that in verse 11, that very next verse, it brings us back to that thought of the two anointed ones who are standing before the Lord. The two olive trees, the candlesticks. But the Lord was saying the key is being faithful in that time of reduction, in that time of having that small thing. And so we have to be careful not to despise the small things that God speaks and gives us to oversee, because as we are faithful to them, authority is given. Authority. Now, traditionally, we look at this as a fulfillment of the millennium, and that's very true. Those who are faithful with with the the what God has given them to do will rule and reign with Christ when He returns. And it's going to be such a glorious time. But you know, as our commission as a fellowship has has been mentioned several times throughout the convention, is our call is to have Bible schools in every nation, in many cities around the world. And I was just thinking, you know, sometimes you look at those and of all the different nations and, you know, cities, and we think, how are we going to get in there? How are we going to get inroads into those places well, all of those cities are in, the, are in the kingdom of God, right? That are in the earth. They're in his kingdom. They're controlled and governed by him. And God says he gives authority over cities to those who have been faithful with the least. Been faithful with the small things he has given them to do. Those are the ones who receive authority. He will grant them authority. And, and so we want to say, Lord, help me to be faithful. Lord, I want to be faithful in everything you've given me to do because that releases authority in the kingdom of God. Authority to go and proclaim his word, to bind the strong man, to cast him out, and for the spirit of God to reign. The unfaithful servant, he didn't consider what was given to him valuable or worth it to labor for something so seemingly insignificant. And so he missed it. But the faithful servant was granted authority because he was faithful with those small things. Now, the second level of provision that Elijah experienced was when the Lord brought him from the brook Cherith, and he brought him to a town called Zarephath. Zarephath. Now, he wasn't out of the trial. There was still no rain in the land. The whole land was suffering, even the Gentiles. And in this Gentile city of Zarephath, I don't think there was much uh, provision. But this word, or the name of this town, Zarephath, it means refining of metals. And perhaps it was known as a foundry for a place of metalworking, but it seems as if God was using it to do a refining in and through the prophet Elijah. And, you know, of course, with that concept of refining, it, it represents God doing a deep work within us, even deeper. You know, the progression of his work. A work had already been done, but God wanted something deeper, something more pure, more holy, more righteous. And in one sense, we could be taken to Zarephath many times over the course of our walk with God because there's a continual work that he wants to do. Times of intensity 
where the heat is turned up. You know, it has to be high heat to melt metals. And he turns up that heat in our lives and there's difficulties. We feel like we're not going to make it. But as we cry out to God, he sustains us. And we come out with something new. Well, something removed and something new. He does something within us. And one of the thoughts I was getting with this idea of Zarephath, refining of metals, you know, is one of the things about metal is it's, it's a, a conduit for, for electricity, for power. We're very familiar with that today. If we're building something, we, we hook up the electrical works through wires that are metal. Um, and, you know, there's that refining process removes the resistance in that metal so the electricity can flow to a greater degree, to a greater power. Iron and steel can conduct metal, but we don't use that very much for conducting electricity. Um, it's not the best conductor, it has resistance in it. So we use copper. Copper has very low resistance to electricity. Um, and so we use that because we've been refined. And the power, God wants that power to flow through us. And so Zarephath is doing that within our hearts. He's removing that resistance to God's ways so his power can flow. Of course, the ultimate metal for electrical, you know, electricity, conducting electricity, is purified gold. That conducts electricity um, where it's, it's the, the choice, the preferred choice of conducting electricity in very delicate electronics and so forth. Of course, we know that describes the work that God wants to do in our heart. As Job said in Job 23.10, but he knows the way that I take, and when he's tried me, I'll come forth as gold. Job was already a righteous man, but there was a little bit of refinement that God wanted to do so that he could give him the double portion and have more flowing through him. You know, one of the things that, that sets gold apart, it's actually not, it doesn't have the highest or, or the, the least level of resistance. Copper has less. The difference between copper and gold is that gold will not corrode. It stays the same. It will not corrode. You know, you can, one of the things about gold that's interesting, you can put it in water, you can put it in the ocean, you can bury it in the, in the dirt, uh, and you can bring it out thousands of years later. You can clean off the surface contaminants, and it looks the, the same as when the day it was made. My wife and I were in Greece, and we went to this very ancient site of Mycenae, and we saw what was called the, what's called the Mask of Ag Agamemnon. We actually, it was a copy there at Mycenae. The real one is in Athens in the museum. But it's a gold funeral mask that was made in the 1500s B.C., and it still looks like they made it yesterday because it's pure gold. But that's why gold represents eternity because it stays the same. When it's purified, it doesn't change. Silver is actually the best conductor of electricity, has the least resistance, but it's almost never used because silver corrodes. It doesn't take too long for silver to start to get tarnished and uh, no one can really use it. And you know, what good is it when people are used mightily for God, but they don't remain in that way? Their lives and standards start to deteriorate, and it can cause a lot of damage, both in the natural and the spiritual. And so we want to cry out to the Lord, Lord, do that work of consistency, of continuance that our hearts will continue, an eternal work. And so God wants to do that work of refining in us so we will be consistent with him, but then that produces something for us. It produces that second level of provision. It was a barrel of meal and oil that did not run out. It was continual. I don't, I don't know if they, if they looked different in the town because everyone else was fasting and they could eat as much as they wanted. I don't know. But, you know, I think they could, they could probably have breakfast, lunch, and dinner instead of just two meals a day. It was, it was a continual flow as much as they wanted from that, and it never ran out until it started to rain. And this is also where we see the resurrection power begin to flow. Right? When the, the son of this widow woman died, 
It says Elijah went, he cried out to God three times, and it says the soul of the child came back into him because there was a power that was released. And so Zarephath produces a, a continuity in our lives where we are able to continue to walk with God and in receiving his life, we receive resurrection power. But now we come to the third level of provision that Elijah experienced. And as Pastor Wallace shared, it was a great time of discouragement that he was going through. He had had to flee into the wilderness from Jezebel and her army. And he must have felt as if the enemy destroyed any good work that he had done for God. Because he was out there, his life was being sought, and he was all alone. No No one else was making a stand for God that he could see. And so he came and sat under that juniper tree and he said, Lord, this is it. This is as far as I can go. I can't go any farther. And we've already heard uh, James 5, 17, where it says, Elijah was a man subject to like passions as we are. And, you know, like passions basically means he was vulnerable. He was vulnerable to the same desires, the same temptations, Even after all of his experiences with God, of how he had met God and been used by him, being preserved in the drought, drought, he was discouraged. And when the angel came and touched him under that tree and gave him food and drink, it was as if it wasn't enough. He was so discouraged and he just rolled back over and went, went to sleep again. It was only after the second time that the angel touched him that Elijah got up and continued in his journey. And and so you could say in a sense that Elijah had come to the end of himself. His own strength, his own ability. Even what strength he had known in God was not enough anymore. He had to come to a new place. But that's really the place of the divine work. When God brings us to the end of ourselves, he can really work because we have gotten out of the way. And then he can perform his miracle. And so the angel touches Elijah for the second time, and he's empowered. But you know, when you think about it, Elijah is not empowered in perhaps the sense he would have liked. He was not empowered to overcome at that point. He wasn't empowered to defeat his enemies, to defeat Jezebel. He still had to walk 40 days through the wilderness and meet God at the holy mountain at this point. And so he wasn't empowered to overcome, but he was empowered to continue. He was empowered to continue and not give up until he went and met the Lord. And, you know, sometimes this is not the empowerment and the anointing we're looking for from God. Lord, anoint me. I've got some enemies. I've got some opposition. Lord, I'm looking for the anointing that's going to break the yoke and destroy them in Jesus' name. And when we don't get that, Lord, what went wrong? And I think that's what Elijah was probably thinking. Lord, what went wrong? Where is the anointing that's destro- that should destroy Jezebel? He didn't receive that anointing. And so this third level of provision and anointing, which is the most powerful, it was just a meal or two in the wilderness. And that anointing, which is you know, almost insignificant in that sense of just that meal or two, but it's the most powerful because it enabled him to continue in his journey where he met God at the holy mountain. It wasn't what he was looking for, perhaps, but it was what he needed. He needed the anointing to continue until he received the promise, until he received that visitation from God, until he received the outpouring that gave him the vision of what to do. I've appreciated, as I mentioned, the messages so far in this convention, and you know, I was really quickened and encouraged by last night's message, what the Lord spoke through Pastor Gadsway. He's allowed me to call him Uncle Daniel, and I'm very grateful for that privilege. But, you know, the Lord was speaking to him about the cloud, that the Lord showed him that cloud, and, you know, that, that it represented the season changing, the season changing. And he related it back to that thought of Elijah, how Elijah saw the cloud and he instantly knew a change is coming. And it's coming quickly. 
But notice what Elijah said. We're going to go back in the story a little bit to 1 Kings 18.44. That after Elijah saw that cloud, he sent his servant and he said, Say unto Ahab, prepare your chariot. Prepare your chariot. And get down and run that the rain not prevent you. He said unto Ahab, prepare. The rain's coming. And so what did, what did Elijah do? He ran. He really ran. I mean, uh, he ran greater than anything we, we really have seen before. You know, he ran the almost 20 miles between Mount Carmel and, and Jezreel, and it wasn't a jog. He was beating, you know, he was in a race with the chariots of Ahab, probably the finest, well, of what horses they had left through the drought, but I'm sure they could still run pretty fast. And so he was racing them, and he beat them. When he saw that cloud, he knew he had to run, and he needed the anointing. And of course, he was anointing, anointed because that was supernatural. And so as we are coming to that place near the end of our wilderness journey, God wants to meet us. He wants to anoint us to continue. In fact, he wants to anoint us to go in strength until we come to his holy mountain. And not just to keep, keep going, but to prepare, as, as Elijah said to Ahab, prepare your chariots. To make ourselves ready, to even be empowered by the spirit of might to prepare because the rain is coming. That the rain prevent us not. Have you ever tried to get something ready? You know, an event or something, and you see the rain clouds, and it's like, oh no. Hurry, quick, get everything in. You know, if you have a picnic, maybe you're, you're under a pavilion, but, you know, if it's raining, it's still hard to get ready. It's much easier to, to prepare for something. If it starts raining and everyone's there, you all squeeze in under the pavilion, that's okay, but it's really hard to prepare when the rain is pouring down. And so the Lord is saying, prepare. The rain is coming. God is going to pour out His Spirit. He's going to meet us in His holy mountain where He'll clarify the vision and pour out His Spirit. And He's going to fulfill that in our lives and fellowships. But we must be anointed to run, anointed to continue until we come to that point, anointed to prepare. And so I wanted to leave these thoughts with you from Elijah, concerning Elijah. His, his life can be very encouraging very instructive to our lives, especially in the days that we're living in and we're coming into, because God wants to meet with us. He wants to provide for us. He wants to be our sole source of provision. As I think Pastor Rob mentioned, there's a lot of fear out there for people who think, well, when it gets bad, where's my provision going to be come from? And so some people are stockpiling all sorts of this, that, and you know, 10-year food, 20-year food, and that kind of thing. And that's going to be my source of provision, but we know that that's not a very safe source. You see, if God is our source of provision, there's safety, there's rest, there's peace, so that when calamity is coming and people are panicking and we, and we have an excitement in our heart, ooh, God, you're moving, because we know you're going to provide, you're going to pour out as we trust in you. Perhaps not in ways we expect, because sometimes his provision is to reduce everything down to just the very essential that we need. But it is as we're faithful in that, authority is given in his kingdom. And of course, God brings us into seasons of deep refinement, but it's so that we will have a greater flow in his power and in his spirit. But ultimately, God wants to empower us to continue beyond our abilities and talents so that it's by His Spirit. And I think we're in a day and an hour where we need this anointing. Lord, anoint me to continue. Anoint me to go on until I reach that holy mountain. And I'm prepared and I'm ready to be used by you to fulfill the vision that has been given to us so that we can hear his voice. And so may God anoint us with the double portion of his anointing to continue and to carry on until we fulfill what he has for us. Amen? Amen. The Lord bless you.